Hello and welcome to this video on multiplying radicals with unlike indices. All right, and this indices, this is just the plural of the word index. All right, so what we're going to be doing in this video is multiplying two radical expressions in which the indices are different, right? They're unlike. So multiplying maybe a square root by a cube root, right, with an index of 2 and 3 respectively or a, you know, a cube root by a fourth root, or whatever, right? or a square root by a fifth root, and so on. Right? And just, um, I'm going to point out to you too that in this case, you cannot use the product rule, right? the product property that we've seen in a couple videos prior to this. All right, so I just got a couple examples, and they're both of you know two radicals with different indices, right? So like, you know, this example here, we've got the fourth root of five, right? For this radical, the index is four, right? It's the fourth root times the cube root of three, right? For this radical, the index is three, right? These, these are unlike indices. They're not the same, they're unlike. Um, so note, when indices are unlike, we cannot use the following, that product property, right? I'll make that note over here. So when indices, right, indexes are unlike, you cannot use the product property for radicals. I remember what that product property was. That was that, you know, the nth root of A times the nth root of B. You know, you could put those together and make the nth root of the product of A and B. You know, as long as these were real, Right, as long as the nth root of a was a real number and the nth root of b was a real number. But yeah, the, the, hopefully you can see why you can't use it. Because this property, the two radicals in the product have the same index. Right? Here, they do not. So don't, don't make a... There's a very common mistake I see with these where you take the fourth root... I'll put this off to the side as well. Don't do the following. You see the fourth root of, you know, five and multiplied by the third root, the cube root of three. People very often, just because they're lazy and don't feel like thinking about it or checking their work, they just, you know, oh, I'm gonna multiply the insides. Five times three is 15. And then I'm going to multiply these, you know, 4 times 3 is 12, and it ends up being the 12th root of 15. This is wrong, all right? And let me show you that it's wrong. Let's actually check the work like you should be doing, all right? Always check your work, make sure you're doing things right. I'm going to check this with the calculator here, right? So let's see if this is, are, if these are the same, you know. Um, got the fourth root the fourth root of five, right? Then after that times the third root or cube root of three. That gives me the number, you know, 2.156666137, uh, okay, and so on. Look at the other side, how about the 12th root? All right, so I'm gonna enter this radical with an index of 12. The 12th root of 15 is 1.253 blah 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 right not the same number right the, these are not the same do, don't do that all right don't just multiply the insides and then multiply the index indexes or indices all right so yeah when it when it comes to having different indices when indices are unlike you cannot use this product property all right so what do we do well, what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite these so that we can use this product property. All right. So here's how. 
right, we have to recall one more thing, one more property you know, I've put up in previous videos. Uh, we have to remember that relationship between radicals and, 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 and rational exponents. So hopefully you remember this. If not, here it is again. Recall that when you take an nth root of some number, so say the nth root of a, that's exactly the same thing as saying, you know, taking the radicand as the base and raising to the one nth power, the fr fraction power. All right. Um, additionally, if you have the nth root of some number to the mth power on the inside there, you're doing the same thing. You just take a to the mth and then raise it to the one over nth power. And then you have a power to a power that you multiply and you know, m times one over n would be m over n. All right, this was another thing we saw. Uh, we also had one other thing where we had the nth root of a and then raised to you know, the mth power on the outside ended up being the same thing equivalent to a to the m over n power, a to a fraction power. All right, but it's really these two that are going to be important in this video. Okay, the first two. So if you keep that in mind, you know, the relationship between a radical and a fraction exponent, uh, it's going to be very helpful for us to rewrite this. I'm going to rewrite these so that we can use the product property. All right, well, let's see how to do that. All right. So again, I have, I'll write it again down here. We had the fifth, the fourth root of five, the fourth root of five multiplied by, you know, the, the cube root of three. All right. And, uh, you know, can't do anything right now. They don't have the same index. Can't put them together right now, but let's think about these with exponents. All right. The fourth root of five is the same thing as five to the one fourth power, All right. five to the one fourth power times the cube root of three is the same thing as three to the one third power. And then what we're going to do, right? You see how the denominators are the indices of the radicals. Remember denominators of the powers, right? Denominator n, index n. Denominator four, index four. The denominators of the, of the powers of the exponents are the indices of the roots of the radicals. So what we're going to do is write the fraction powers so that they have a common denominator then you'll have a common index. You'll have, you'll be able to write these so that they have the same index and then you can use this product property. So write the fraction exponents. So they have a common denominator. All right, so let's see how that would work here, how that would look. So here are my exponents. The exponents are one fourth and one third. So remember how you, you know, remember when you were like adding and subtracting fractions and you needed to, you know, you needed to get a common denominator. So you looked for, you know, what was the least common multiple of the denominators or the LCD, the least common denominator. Wait, what, what's the LCD of these two denominators? The least common multiple of these two is, you know, 12, all right? The least common multiple of three and four is 12. And then remember how once you found that LCD, how you would, you know, you would change the fractions so that they had that denominator. So I'd have to multiply this one fourth. I'd have to multiply the denominator by three and also the numerator by three, right? Whatever you do, you can't multiply the denominator by a number and not the numerator. It'll change the value entirely. But if you multiply the top and bottom, the numerator and denominator by the same thing, it's like multiplying by one, right? And that way you're not changing the value. Same thing over here, right? I want to change this into 12. I would need to multiply it by four. So denominator by four and also the numerator by four. 
And when you multiply fractions, you just multiply the numerators, multiply the denominators. So the, these powers now look like this. So instead of 5 to the 1 fourth, that's 5 to the, you know, 1 fourth is equivalent to 3 twelfths. That's 5 to the 3 twelfths, 3 over 12. And then times, you know, 3 to the, instead of 1 third, 1 third is 4 twelfths. Right. And now look, they have the same denominator, these powers, these exponents. They have the same denominator, meaning I can rewrite them as radicals with the same index using this relationship right here. I'm going to put a big star next to it or something. Right? Do, 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 do. This relationship right here, huge. 5 to the 3 twelfths. When you write as a radical, you could write it as the twelfth root. Right? The twelfth root, right? index of 12, the denominator, of, and then you know 5 to the third power on the inside. Okay, that's 5 to the 3 twelfths, which is the you know, same as 5 to the 1 fourth. This value here is exactly the same as the one I started with. It looks weird, I know, but, but it is. Times, and then 3 to the 4 twelfths power, if I write it as a radical, is the twelfth root. Right, the denominator is the index, the twelfth root of, and then you know 3 to the 4th power, right, 3 to that numerator of the power, on the inside. Right, again, I'm just using this relationship right here. And now look at it. You know, we started off with this, the fourth root of five times the cube root of three, where they have different indices. And through use of, you know, the rational exponents, fraction exponents, and, you know, getting those fraction exponents to have a common denominator, we now see it as an equivalent expression where the indices are the same. right? They're both, they're both 12, right? They're both 12th roots. So now I can use the product property. So now we, you know, so now we can, you know, same indices. So now we can use the product property. So the 12th root of five cubed multiplied by the 12th root of three to the fourth would be the twelfth root of you know five to the third times three to the fourth, all as one radical. All right, and this would be considered simple because you know the original expression had two radicals. This has one less. It only has one radical, so it would be considered simpler. And if you know, and you really can't simplify this because there are no perfect twelfth powers, right? There are no exponents in here that are multiples of twelve. All the exponents in here on these prime factors, 5 and 3, are, you know, less than 12. So I can't, you know, break this up into perfect 12th powers and non-perfect 12th powers. All right, so this is as simple as it gets. And when, I multi when you actually multiply that number out, this is the 12th root, right, the 12th root of, and I'm just going to punch this in, uh, 5 to the 3rd power. Then that times, you know, 3 to the 4th which is, you know, 81. So it's 125 times 81. That's 10,125. And that's, you know, that's, again, considered simpler than the original because it's a single radical instead of, you know, the product of two radicals. It has fewer radicals. And let's double check that. All right, I am going to double check, make sure that that indeed is the same value as what we started with. All right, so what we started with, I had the fourth root of five. So a, a radical with an index of four. Five is the radicand. Then after that times, you know, the cube root of three. That number is, you know, two point, I put this up earlier, right? And remember, I, I compared it to the 12th root of 15, and you know, it wasn't the 12th root of 15. Clearly not, right? It's the 12th root of 10,125. That's 2.156666137, so on. 
And let's see if this is this 12th root, the 12th root, right, uh, radical with an index of 12, of, you know, the radicand is 10,125. Is this the same number? And look, yes, it is. Both 2.156666137 and so on. Great. But yeah, this is you know, pretty kind of tricky, right? When you're asked to simplify the product of two radicals with different indices, again, you change it so that they have fraction powers, rewrite those fractions so they have the same denominator, and then you can rewrite them as radicals with the same index. And if you have radicals with the same index of real numbers, you can use that product property and then simplify, you know, it's considered simplified. Wonderful. All right, so I have just one more example of that, where again, I'm multiplying two numbers, two, two radicals with different indices. So here are my radicals, right? I have this, what's the square root of 10 multiplied by the cube root of 12, right? So this, in, this has an index of two. Remember when there's no number in this little crook, this little V area, uh, that's implied that the, you know, the index is two, it's a square root. Right? And then this has an index of three, right? It's a cube root. So they are, you know, unlike Right, they're not they're not the same index, so I can't use the product property. And again, don't don't just multiply these and say it's the you know the put put you know ten times twelve put one hundred and twenty under the radical and then take three times two multiply the indices. You know it's not the sixth root of one hundred and twenty. I promise you. And you can again check that with a calculator. But I see that happen way too often. All right, so again, what we're doing here is you know, using that relationship between radicals and rational exponents. All right, so the square root of 10, right? The square root of 10 is exactly the same as writing 10 as the base to the one half power. All right, that's the square root of 10 multiplied by, then the cube root of 12 is exactly the same as writing 12 as the base to the one third power. All right. And then as before, you know, look at my powers. They are one half and one third. And I'm going to try to rewrite these so they have the same denominator, right? That way I can write them as radicals with the same index. Well, the least common multiple of the denominators or the least common denominator LCD here would be, you know, the least common multiple of two and three, that'd be six. So what needs to happen to, you know, change these fractions to denominators, uh, fractions with a denominator of six, you know, I'd multiply this fraction by three in the denominator, three in the numerator, that'll give me a denominator of six. So that's three sixths, right? It's the same as one half. And multiply this fraction by two in the denominator, two in the numerator, that would be two sixths. All right, so I'm gonna rewrite those powers. Okay, so over here, this is 10. And instead of to the one half power, well, one half is equal to three over six to the three sixth power uh, multiplied by and then 12, the base to the, and instead of the one third power, one third is equal to two six, two over six. And now I have two, you know, fractional exponents with the same denominator. And using that relationship between, again, fraction exponents and radicals, we can write these as a radical with the sixth root, right? The index of six, 10 to the three six, I can write as the sixth root of 10 to the third. Right, or the sixth root of a thousand, 10 to the third, times, and then this 12 to the two sixths power, again, denominator of that power is six, so I can write it as the sixth root of 12 squared, right? 12 to the, the numerator of that power. Right. And then putting these together, now I, now I can, right? Now they have the same index of six, so we can use that product property. A sixth root times a sixth root is another sixth root 
of, you know, 10 cubed times 12 squared. Now, 12 squared is 144, 10 cubed is 1,000, so we have the sixth root, the sixth root of 144,000. And there you go. And I believe that's completely simplified. Let me let me try to factor this here. Let's see, 10 cubed times 12 squared, uh, squared. Well, you know that 10 is 2 times 5, right? So that means that 10 cubed is 2 cubed times 5 cubed, right? And uh, 12 is 2 squared times 3. So 12 squared would be 2 to the 4th, right, you'd have 2 more 2's times 3 squared. And then putting these together, you know, when they have the 10 cubed times the 12 squared, you have 2 to the 3rd here, 2 to the 4th there, that'd be 2 to the 7th in the prime factorization. Uh, and then you have a 3 squared in there, and a 5 to the 3rd. Uh, so yeah, this, this won't simplify, because when I break it down to primes, none of the powers on those primes are higher than 6. Oh no! No, it is, it's the 6th root. Now, I was thinking about the last example with the 12th root. Um, no, we're, we can actually simplify this a bit more. 2 to the 7th, that is a power that's higher than 6. So I could pull off... So, sorry about this, I'm going to take another page here. All right, I could pull off a 2 to the 6th power off of this times, and then you'd have 2 to the 1st times 3 squared times 5 to the third, right? None of the other powers are higher than, are 6 or higher. So there is a perfect 6 power that I could pull off of this. So this can actually be simplified even further, right? So instead of the 6th root of 144,000, I can break it up into the product rule for this. You know, what's the 6th root of 2 to the 6th? That'd be 2. And then times the 6th root of all the, you know, non-perfect 6 powers, the 2 times 3 squared times 5 cubed. Right, so we have 2 on the outside times the 6th root of, and I'll just punch this in my calculator, what is, what is 2 times 3 squared times 5 cubed. Alright, that's 2,250. Right, so this, this would be considered a simplified radical, right, because, you know, there's no more there aren't any more perfect sixth powers that go into the radicand evenly, right? 2,250 is divisible by, you know, twos and threes and fives, but n none to the sixth power or higher. Okay. All right, let's double check. All right, let's double check. Now, if you kept it there, that's cool. But again, this is this is more consider considered more simplified because, again, there is no perfect sixth power that goes in the radicand. All right, let's check. Here was our original expression, you know, the square root of 10 times the cube root of 12. And here's what I got finally in the end after simplifying and, you know, getting the, the common denominator and, you know, com common index, same index, and then using the product property. So let me punch these in. All right, so my original expression is, you know, the square root of 10. And after that, times the cube root of 12 And we're getting there, the number 7.23980855. Okay. Punch this in now. And hopefully I get the same number. All right, so 2 times, right, 2 on the outside times, and then the 6th root. All right, so a radical with an index of 6. The 6th root of 2250, right, 2250. And look at that. It is indeed uh, the same number, 7.23980855 and so on. Right. Wonderful. Okay, um, but yeah, so a little, little tricky these, right? Don't just multiply the indices and multiply the radicands, please, right? It's not that simple. Change to fractional powers, right? Change the radicals to expressions with fraction powers, then, you know, rewrite those fractions so they have the same denominator, and then you can rewrite as radicals with the same index. And once you have radicals with the same index, you can then use the product property and simplify as you need to. Great. All right. And as I like to say at the end of all these videos, you know, please try your best to learn the material on your own before you go looking for help. 
I find that people who tend who take the time and effort to learn things on their own tend to remember those for longer and remember it better. I'm more proud of it. So read the material, of course. Read through the author's examples. Perhaps even try to work out the solutions to some of the author's examples before you see how the author did it. And then compare your work with the author's and see if you can learn from some mistakes there. And uh, of course, practice plenty of exercises, practice problems, you know, check solutions when they're made available to you so you can see how you're doing. Keep track of your progress. And don't give up on a problem after one attempt. Don't give up so easily. You know, very often in mathematics, you know, there are several approaches that'll work for any particular problem. So if after several attempts or several approaches at a problem, you're still not getting it, still not understanding it, perhaps you should read the material again, maybe even a third time, more slowly, more deliberately. Take good notes. Because uh, if you've been doing some problems, you know, chances are you also have a better idea as to what the author wants from you, what the author is expecting of you. So then a second read-through or even third read-through, you know, you'll, you'll have a better um, idea as to what to look out for. And you'll probably catch some things that you didn't catch the first time or things will make more sense the second or third time through that didn't make sense the first time. And it'll make working on the problems that much easier. But if after that, you know, if after several read-throughs of the material, several attempts at problems, you're still not understanding it, still not getting it, still still, still hard to do, you know, it is not a sign of weakness whatsoever to go out looking for help. That is what other people are there for, to help you. Ask a teacher, a tutor, a friend, someone in your class who you know knows the material well and is willing to help. Look for supplemental materials online. There's loads of it out there. Look for videos online. There's loads of those too, um, like this one, or plenty of other ones out there that are better than this one. I assure you, you can find them easily. But just keep at it. Stay persistent. Keep practicing. Don't give up. And above all, you know, try to stay positive. Have a positive attitude about the subject. You know, believe in yourself. That I know that's easier said than done, and that's probably the hardest thing. But try to go into you know, a math session with an open mind, thinking you're going to learn something, you're going to take something away from it, maybe even have some fun with it. You know, amazing the difference a change in mindset, a change in outlook can make in the learning experience. So stay persistent, keep practicing, stay positive, and never give up. Don't give up. And I, and I just, I believe in you. I, I know you can do it, and I know you can get it. And thank you very much for watching.